We stand here in your presence because of the power of Christ. We are able to come into your presence just as we are in spite of who we are because of you. The grace that we experience in our lives, such grace it is, God. We thank you for that grace. This morning we choose to lift up your name in our lives, through our lives, our actions, our behavior, our words, everything that we are, God. We want to make sure that Christ is glorified through our lives and our testimony. We may falter many times, fail many times, and yet by your grace, we are helped to stand firm. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for you are a God who never gives up on us, keeps pursuing us, helping us, nudging us, guiding us, showing us the paths that we need to walk in. And so we are grateful to you for all that. As we walk into your presence today and as we stand here in your presence today, those of us who joined online at our homes or maybe workplaces, may your presence fill us right now. May you see our needs, God. May you show compassion towards us. May the miracles that require in physical bodies, may they experience healing, complete healing, God. May those who are struggling with loneliness and rejection in their hearts, disappointed, disheartened, some of them on the verge of depression, we pray for them. Together, as your body, we pray, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill them, comfort them. Counsel them in the time of their need. May they experience your friendship truly today, even as we pray together. For those who are struggling in finances, God, I pray that you'd open doors for them. Provide them what they need on time, miraculously, abundantly, God. That we know that those who look to you will be radiant with joy and their faces will never be put to shame. Your word tells us that. And so we know that when we look to you, we will never be shamed. Those who fear you will lack no good thing, your word says, God. Even, a, even young lions may go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will have all their needs met. And so I pray for those who are trusting you today, placing their confidence on in you, God, taking you as their refuge. I pray for them. Whatever need that they have today, would you miraculously provide to them? We release your power upon their lives, in their midst, in our midst, in their families, at their workplaces. Thank you, God, that you gave us the opportunity to worship you today. And as we look to you, we open our hearts, our minds. We ask you to take control of our thoughts. And God, would you speak to us? For your word is life to us. Thank you, God. For you are a God who always speaks. So speak, Lord, for your servants are listening today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you put your hands together and praise our God this morning. What a joy it is to come into his presence. Even as you stand, let me congratulate you for World Cup victory. For those of you who stayed up to one o'clock in the night, just bear another one hour before you go home and sleep. Open your Bibles to Psalm 112. I'd like to read Psalm 112 and set the context today for today's word. We are continuing our series called Legacy. We started three weeks back on um, a topic called Legacy. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. 
How joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Their children will be successful everywhere. An entire generation of godly people will be blessed. They themselves will be wealthy and their good deeds will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for godly. They are generous, compassionate and righteous. Good comes to those who lend money generously and conduct their business fairly. Such people will not be overcome by evil. Those who are righteous will be long remembered. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust um, uh, the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. The wicked will see this and be infuriate, infuriated. They will grind their teeth in anger. They will slink away and their hopes thwarted. You may be seated. This morning, uh, as I uh, mentioned, we are continuing our series called Legacy. As we began our missions month, this month, and we are of course at the, at the end of the missions month, we, I introduced to you that we are going to discuss on legacy. How important it is for us to leave a legacy through our lives. In week one, uh, when we started this series, I talked about it's important for us to remember that what we leave behind matters a lot. Whether we are moving from one place to another place, from one job to another job, one neighborhood to another neighborhood, from one fellowship to another fellowship, or from here on earth to heaven. Whatever, wherever, whatever we do, wherever we are, once we leave from that place, Whatever is talked about us after we leave is our legacy. And that matters a lot. Because what you leave behind not only affects the people you left, but also affects the people who will come after you. That's why it's a matter of high priority, especially for those who say that they are Christians and they are believers, to know that your legacy matters a lot to God and it matters a lot to the generations that come after. I took two lives from the scripture and compared their lives and showed you how legacy can affect not only your personal life, but also affects those who come after you. How our children will either be blessed or will be cursed because of us, because of our actions today because of our lifestyle today, because of our faith today, our children will be affected. You cannot take those matters lightly. You and I know, need to know that it matters to God, it matters to us, and it more, more, more importantly, it matters to our children that we leave a good legacy when we leave from here. Uh, that's why... Um, as we looked at the lives of David and Jeroboam, we saw the kind of difference that they both made upon the generations that came after them. Both these people were picked by God, both David and Jeroboam. Both of them were nothing in the sight of others, but God picked them up. Both of them were honored by God by giving them a high place in that entire country. David became a king. Jeroboam became a king. Both of them were given the same promise by God. We always look at David's promise. We should also pay attention to the promise God made to Jeroboam too. It's exactly the same promise. To David, God said, as long as you follow my commands, I will bless you, I will establish you, and I will establish your throne your children will always be on that throne. 
exactly the same promise he gave to Jeroboam. And he said, Jeroboam, if you follow what I command you today and follow me as David followed me, I will establish your throne. I will establish your kingdom. You will rule that kingdom with all your heart and your children will always be there. It's a promise, same promise. No change in that. So God is not partial when it comes to commands, uh, promises to people. Same. When David chose to keep up um, his commitment to the Lord, God blessed it. That's why even when Solomon messed up, Rehoboam messed up, and some of the descendants of David messed up, God still spared them, and every time he spared them, he told them, because of your father David, I'm leaving you alone. You see the blessing? Solomon really messed up what God gave him. Rehoboam, even worse. And yet, when God spoke to Solomon, God says to Solomon, Solomon, I'm leaving you alone, even though you messed up because of your father. When he spoke to Jeroboam and gave the promise to Jeroboam, he said, Jeroboam, I am leaving one tribe to David because I made a promise to David. Rest of the 10 tribes are yours. I'll give you the bigger portion of the, of the kingdom. Um, as long as you keep my commands, your children will always be blessed. But when Jeroboam messed up, God came to him again, the same God who gave a promise, and told him, listen, because you did not do, because you did not follow what I, what I uh, asked you to do, and uh, you did not take my promise seriously, I'm going to destroy you, destroy your children. Not even a single person from your family will be alive. And God literally wiped out Jeroboam's family from the face of this earth. It's a dangerous thing for us not to think about our legacy. Every Christian who calls himself a believer and a disciple of Jesus must pay attention to what we are going to leave behind. It matters to God. It matters to us. It matters to our children. That's why we do need to take time to ponder on that. What, what, how are we living our lives? How are we behaving here on earth? How are we talking? What kind of influence are we making on people? We must pay attention to those things. Then, the following week, of course, I, I didn't have an opportunity to speak in English service. Um, we had um, Brother Edward Williams come on for our English service. But I spoke a, a, in the uh, other services and I and talked about a second principle. And so just for the sake of this congregation, I'm going to just mention that principle. The, the second thing I talked about is how do we leave a fruit in our lives? Now, if our legacy matters a lot, how do we leave a right fruit here on earth? Taking from John chapter 15, and Jesus, I'm not teaching that today, okay? But I'm just giving you a heads up so that you can remember. John chapter 15, Jesus talked to his disciples and talked about how to become fruitful in our lives. The entire chapter, Jesus spent explaining what makes a person fruitful person. And everything that Jesus taught in John chapter 15 boggled down to one single principle, one single thing. You obey my commands. You will be fruitful. That's it. Whatever I tell you to do, just obey it and you will be fruitful. In John chapter 15 verses 16, then Jesus goes on to say, I know on your own you can't be fruitful. So therefore, I want you to remember this. You have not chosen me. I chose you. That's number one. Number two, I appointed you. Appointed to do what? So that you can be fruitful. And when you are fruitful, everything that you ask in my name, my father will do it for you. And I talked about the kind of future prophetic statement that Jesus made. What Jesus is saying is this. First of all, on your own, you can never be my disciple. I choose you. You don't choose me. That's number one. Number two, I appoint you. Simply means, once I appoint you, nobody can remove you from that place. 
That's what Jesus told his disciples. So don't live in this fear that you will fall. Don't live in this fear that somebody will uh, destroy your life. Somebody will destroy your faith. Somebody will destroy your family. They can't. If God appoints, nobody can remove you from that place. That's number two. Number three, he says, I will make you fruitful. I chose you. I appoint you so that you can be fruitful. What he's saying is, already in prophetic uh, word, Jesus is saying, you will be fruitful. So stop worrying about how to become fruitful. Uh, you will be fruitful. As long as you are in me, my word is in you, and you obey my commands. So how do you leave a legacy? By becoming fruitful. The only way to become fruitful is to obey the commands of God. So now, in Psalm 112, I'm picking up exactly from there. The Psalm 112 talks about what happens when a person obeys God. What's the right way to obey God? Entire Psalm in 10 verses, well, 9 verses, 10th verse is the anti uh, thesis of it. The 9 verses talk about what happens when you obey God. If I have to put that in one single principle, this is what the psalmist is trying to teach us in, with regards to our legacy. Here is, here is what I think he is teaching. I believe he's teaching and, and that's what we need to learn. That generosity is the measure of our life. If you look at Psalm 112, again and again the psalmist talks about the reason this person is called a righteous man, the reason this person is blessed, the reason his children and the generations that come after him, verses 1 and 2, by the way, will be blessed because he's a generous person. Because of his compassion. Because he chooses to do his business in the right way. He conducts himself in the right way. All, all that the psalmist is talking there in Psalm 112 is this. You want to be a righteous person? You want to do what God wants you to do? Be a generous person. Show generosity through your life. Why does it matter to us? It matters to us because that's what makes us fruitful. It matters to us because that's what will leave a good legacy for our children. Look at verses 1, uh, 2. Their children, the, who, who, who are these children? The children of the one who delights in the commands of God. The, uh, the children of the one who obeys his commands. Remember those two. He's, enjo he, he's in the fear of the Lord, this person. He obeys God and he enjoys obeying God. When he does that, his children, that person's children will be successful. And their entire generation will be blessed. The generation that come after that will be blessed. So one single person, uh, one Christian, you, if you live your ri life rightly in the sight of God, not only you are blessed, you will bless your children and their children and the children that come after. And that um, is only possible when we understand uh, the importance of generosity as a Christian. Today, as we conclude our Mission Sunday, Missions Month, um, I think it's fitting that we talk about generosity. This entire psalm, as I began to meditate on it, I believe there are four principles, four truths that we should learn on generosity from this, from this psalm. And then I'll take you all around the scripture and show you through the lives of people who experience those truths. Principle number one, truth number one. Joy comes from generosity. True joy comes from generosity. Every one of us in our lives, whatever we are trying to do, whatever we are trying to earn, whatever you, we are trying to uh, build, we are doing it so that we can be joyful. So that we can be happy. So that our children can be happy. But true joy, real joy, comes from generosity. Not in hoarding, 
but the person who chooses to give it away. Here is the point. The difference between a Christian and a person who does not know Christ should be this, this understanding. What's that understanding? That is this, that God blessed us in order for us to become a blessing. All through the scripture, when God chose people and chose to bless them, he expected them to become a blessing. In fact, he commanded them to be blessing. I'll come to the command part. But that's the point. When he chose Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, the blessing of Abraham is something that we all want to apply in our lives, which is applicable. I have no problem with that. But as much as you want that blessing to be applied to your life, you must also see what comes with the blessing. He says, come and follow me to the land that I ask you to go to. I will bless you. I will bless your generation and I will establish you. I will make you a nation and then you will become a blessing to the world. You see, the, you see that? The end goal of God is not to make you rich. The end goal of God is that when you become rich, you become a blessing. That's the difference. It does not mean you don't enjoy the blessing of God. I'll come to that too. It simply means that while you enjoy the blessing in your life, you must understand as a Christian that your goal is not just simply absorb yourself in the luxury that God gave you, that you must understand that what, is, what God is giving you, the reason God is blessing your business, the reason God is increasing you in your influence is so that you can ultimately become a blessing to somebody else. It's a command. Paul talks about it in 1 Timothy chapter 6. All of us, every Capstonian must read this, okay? Underline it. <clears throat> because comparatively in India, you, you are a rich person. So you must read this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17. Paul is talking to Timothy and he's saying, listen, talk to rich people in your church and tell them this. So all of you are rich people, huh, by the way. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God. Now, why it should be in God? He gives the explanation. Who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. Did you see that? That's why I said, I'm not saying don't enjoy luxuries. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying this, God of course is blessing you so that you can enjoy. But then, he goes on to explain this. Tell them to use their money to do good. Why? They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, uh, always being ready to share with others. Didn't I read exactly the same in Psalm 112? Who is called a righteous person? Who is compassionate, who is willing to give? Share and do good. By doing this, now listen to this. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for their future. Meaning, if I am generous, I am laying a foundation for my own future. Future here on earth and in heaven. And goes on to say, for their future so that they may experience true, true life. So my thesis is simple. Joy comes from generosity. It's a command. I'm not even suggesting you to become generous. I'm saying the Bible demands from you that you be generous. Now you could sit there and argue with me. How can you do that? Aren't we supposed to give only with Happy heart, I'll come to happy heart also. But right now, let me just say this. That God commands you, Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, that you must be generous. Sometimes, God chooses to develop our character through commands. 
just like how every parent would do when our children are young and they are growing up the hardest task for for us to get them to do is to brush their teeth they hate brushing their teeth so you would push them probe them if not spank them to make sure they brush their teeth it's a command that we give to our children every morning as they grow up even though our children hate to do that they still have to do that but then this command as they keep following would become a discipline in their life at some point you don't have to ask them to brush their teeth you may have to ask them to fold their bed sheet but that will come a stage that's another stage by the way but uh, that, that's a discipline they already know when they get up they will just simply walk into the wash bathroom and take the brush and start brushing their teeth as a practice are you understanding now at some point in their life they'll come to a place where they can't think of getting up in the morning without brushing their teeth i mean getting up in the morning getting on to their job without brushing their teeth it has now become a part of their life it's not something they dread anymore it's not something that they don't enjoy anymore they know this is good for me i have to do this does it make sense now so when god says give your tight when god says give generously as a command he's simply teaching you a discipline which will ultimately lead to your joy it's a simple thing and as long as you don't follow the discipline you don't enjoy it and as long you don't enjoy as long as you don't enjoy it you have no joy everything that god commissions to commissions us to do has an ultimate goal your benefit and as you get benefited somebody else getting benefited through you of course brushing my teeth will also benefit others so it's simple you don't you are not generous you don't enjoy your life it's, i'm sorry about that but that's how it is we you know i think it was winston churchill who once said we make li- we make a living by what we get but we make a life by what we give well long before winston churchill said psalm 112 says that you see not only because it's a command it's a responsibility our our responsibility to be generous is a responsibility as the first members of the family of god it naturally becomes our responsibility that we make sure our brothers and sisters who are outside in the world who still do not know christ have an opportunity to listen to the to the gospel of christ and then they come into the family of god where you are now part of and you are enjoying the blessing of god if you are not generous how do you expect the kingdom of god to grow you are enjoying the fruit of what christ has done at the cross the generosity of god the father for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son god showed generosity already you and i are enjoying the fruit of that generosity how can i you and i be selfish and irresponsible by not sharing what we received with others isn't that irresponsibility would any one of you parent would leave your child to be irresponsible wouldn't you discipline them wouldn't you ask them cut to correct their ways wouldn't you rebuke them to ch- and ask them to change their ways so that ultimately they'll be benefited out of this well that's what god is asking us to do right now be generous because i have been generous to you it's your responsibility to do that what we do for ourselves dies with us but what we do for others lives beyond us may we never forget that i say true joy truly comes from generosity 
The second truth that you and I need to learn from this psalm is this. That there is power in sacrificial generosity. First I talked about generosity. Now I'm talking about sacrificial generosity. First, first truth must make you understand I must be generous. Second truth must help us to get, uh, understand the kind of generosity that God demands from us. Sacrificial generosity. It's an act of giving up something that is valued for the sake of something else that is regarded as more important. There is something that you value. Something that you hold dear to you. Something that you feel this is what I need. And it may be true. Absolutely true. 100% right. But the act of giving up what you value the most for something else. Because you recognize giving up this to do that is more important. That's sacrifice. For God so loved the world. He considered loving the world so important that he gave up his only begotten son whom he loves. His son is valuable to him. But he thought, well, the world needs my son more than me right now. So he gave up. Oh, that's God, you may say. But there, is a, there are examples in the scripture who did do that. Sacrificial generosity looks like this. Number one, sacrificial generosity is when you give up what you need the most. There are some things we need. We all need. We all have needs. We all have things to do in our lives. Some of us have more. Some of us have less. Some of us really have very less. And we need that at this point of time in our lives. Sacrificial generosity is to give that up for the sake of those who are in need like you and me. If I'm thirsty and I'm searching for water and this is the only water bottle I could find and I know I have to drink this water bottle, it's my need and I found it. Unless I drink this, I will, my thirst will not be quenched. But when I am aware of somebody else who is also thirsty, who also is in need of water, and I choose to say, I will drink half of this bottle, and then I'll share it with the, the one who is also thirsty, you are giving up what you need. Well, that's what the widow, widow of Zarephath did. All she had was a morsel of flour and a pinch of oil. All she could do with that was to make one chapati and eat. But when Elijah asked her, in the midst of a drought, in the midst of uh, complete lack, she doesn't have anything other than that. What she had was what she needed. What she had was what her son needed. Remember this. But when third person entered into her life and asked for help, she says, this is what I need, and this is all I have, and this will meet my need, but I'm willing to share it with you. When you express sacrificial generosity, it always ends up in a miracle. Isn't that what happened to her? That's all she had, but she decided, I'll share it with somebody else. The moment she shared, she lacked nothing in her own life for the rest of the drought. It's amazing how it works. It doesn't work outside in the world like this. Remember this. It works in the kingdom of God like that. Sacrificial generosity is not only giving up what we need the most, sometimes what we want the most too. There are some things that we always longed for, fought for, worked hard for, some of us have desires within our heart that we want, and the desire itself is nothing wrong, by the way. 
So you want to achieve that. You want to get that. Finally, you acquired it. But sometimes God demands us that what you wanted the most for you to give it up. Not that it, is, it in itself is bad. There's nothing wrong with what you wanted. Nothing wrong with what you got for yourself. Sometimes God simply says, just give it up. For the sake of somebody else who is actually in need of that. You want this, but they need it. You see the difference now? Hannah prayed, wanted to have a child. Without having a child is not a problem. But in the context in which she lived, she wanted to have a child. If God never gave her a child, I don't think Hannah would have suffered in her faith. She would have suffered in the world. She would have suffered among her family members. But I don't think she would have lost her faith in God. But she wanted to have a child. Prayed for it. Worked hard for it. Fasted for it. Went to the temple for it. As she was praying, God gave her a promise. I'll give you a child. She got a child. As she hold, held uh, Samuel in her hand, she knew she had to give this child back to God. At some point after the boy stopped weaning, she could have told to herself, really, how can I give up my little one? I mean, I have so many plans, so many hopes for him. I've got this future lined up for him. Um, to send him to ministry would be sentencing him to death. I mean, this is how most parents think. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'm just simply talking about Hannah today. She could have reasoned it out. She could have said, I really wanted this child. I got this child. Um, but because she decided that she would give up young Samuel, this young Samuel saved a nation. Because a mother decided to give up what she wanted for herself. What if Hannah never gave up Samuel? I don't know if God would have ever punished Hannah for that. I don't think so. But I'm sure Hannah would have watched the, the nation that she loved so dearly, the people she loved so dearly, destroy themselves. Because she didn't give up her child. But because she did, God honored her. You and I need to remember this. Samuel is a great prophet. Bible talks about how great he is. Not a single word that came out of his mouth fell to the ground. What a testimony that is. Huh? There are many things that we talk, many things I would have said from the pulpit. And many things would have fallen to the ground. I'm, of course, I'm no equal to Samuel. Not even close there. But Bible says Samuel's words never fell to the ground. God never let one of his words to fall, fall to the ground. The honor is not Samuel's. The honor is Hannah's. We need to remember that. In the kingdom of heaven, it's a Hannah who would be honored more than Samuel. Because of her sacrifice, you see a man who saved a nation. So sometimes, God demands from us, and we choose, when we choose to give it up, our desire, you are now becoming a blessing to somebody else. So when you give what you need the most, you are sacrificing your need. When you give what you, when you give up what you want the most, you are giving up what you want. You are sac you are sacrificing your want. You understand? But here is the highest form of what I believe is sacrifice. When you give up what you earned, I mean really hard, hard earned, whatever you worked hard for, when you give up what you earned with nobody else's help, nobody was there for you, 
Nobody ever said an encouraging word to you. Nobody ever extended a hand to you. You worked hard for it. You gave up time. You gave up so many things for, for the sake of achieving this, whatever that thing is. This was what you, what you hold in your hand is something you worked for. It's not that you can't live without it, but this is something you earned it. When you give that up, that's true sacrifice. The incident of the woman with alabaster jar of oil is so important in the scriptures because of that. You see, when she broke the jar of oil and was pouring that oil on the feet of Jesus and washing his feet with that oil, everybody around that, around Jesus, had two reactions. One group of people are thinking, what a waste of money. That's what one group of people are thinking. The other group of people are thinking, what a sinful woman she is. She's not even worthy to come to Jesus. She is not worthy to come to Capstone. That's what they're thinking. You see the difference? Everybody, either that group or this group. But that's not what Jesus is looking. He's not even looking at the alabaster of jar of oil. He's looking at what she poured at that point of time. She poured out all that she earned all her life. Obviously, the fact that she's called a sinful woman gives us an insight that she must be a prostitute. Her profession itself is something that is sinful. She sold her body, earned money, and bought the alabaster jar of oil. Please remember that. Bible says that the price of that alabaster jar of oil is worth one year's of wages. That means if I work from morning to evening, eight hours a day, whatever I make, if I keep saving that money all through the year 365 days, I'd have enough money to buy that one jar of oil. So, before she bought that jar of oil, she sold her body for 365 days so that she could make enough money to buy that jar of oil. Don't miss that. If a woman has come to a pl place where she is willing to sell her body, imagine where she would have come from. The absolute poverty that she would have come out of in order to avoid that, escape that, because she couldn't find any other way. I, I don't know if there is any woman who is willingly selling her body. I don't see uh, that in the nature of any woman. I believe anyone who has come to that place must have been forced or come to a place where they, they just don't have an option but this. So either she's forced or she doesn't have any other option. She sold her body so that she can get one jar of alabaster oil and then brings it and pours it at the feet of Jesus. Now that's called sacrifice. That's what Jesus was looking at. That's why you and I are still talking about her. And nobody talks about us. Because of that. Those kind of acts of generosity bring miracles into our lives. Changes our situation completely. The trajectory of our life itself gets transformed because of that. And because we hold back from being generous, either we are giving an excuse that I need it the most, or we are giving an excuse that I want it the most, or we are giving an excuse that I worked for it, nobody helped me, why should I help somebody else? You are missing a miracle in your life. It is true, nobody helped you. 
it is true nobody said a kind word to you i know i understand i, I understand that kind of experience it is true it is you who forged your life to build something but true generosity is when you choose to say i give up myself for the sake of somebody else when you give up what you worked hard for hard earned it you are sacrificing yourself it's the highest form of giving well god did that didn't he that's truth number 2 number 3 the third truth that you and i need to understand this cheerful generosity tickles the heart of god well pleases god that's what i mean if you want to put smile on the face of god give cheerfully now when i talk about those the first two principles you feel obligated to give you'll be like this fellow is is pushing us to give i understand that paul knows those kind of people so he addressed them in second corinthians chapter 9 let's go there it's a it's a chapter that we all need to uh, you know by heart actually every christian talks about giving actually two chapters he talks about giving but chapter 9 is a good chapter for us to study on giving giving cheerfully verses 3 but i'm sending you these brothers to be sure that you are really ready let me pause there why why is he saying that he's saying listen i'm sending somebody ahead of me coming there so that you can be ready to give me that's what he's saying okay the context is i'm sending some people ahead of me by the time i come better keep some offering ready for me that's what he's saying why is he saying that because these people already promised him that they will have a offering ready in chapter 9 verses 1 he told them listen i know your heart i know you want to give me um but i'm sending these people i know how eager you are to give me give an offering to help in fact the fact that you chose to give you said a commitment that i will give made me so joyful that i talked about you everywhere in asia you didn't give me anything but because you promised that you'll give i talked about it to everybody else all over asia i talked about it i said listen there is a church in corinth they are ready to give an offering they are planning to give an offering so you you know they are blessed people and he says in verses 2 because i told them about you they became eager these churches in macedonia have been inspired by your commitment you remember the commitment form that you filled uh, because of that these people poor people they are very happy they are so happy they decided that we will give to out of their poverty there is a sacrificial giving now paul is being very sarcastic okay i'll tell you why he is being sarcastic as he as he says they gave up out of their poverty and they became a blessing to the church in jerusalem now he says now you remember the promise you made um i'm trying to kind of remind you that you are the one who made the promise i'm trying to remind you that listen just because of your commitment somebody else become a blessing to somebody else don't you think you should be too that's what he's saying to the church in corinth now you are a church you already have what you need the church in corinth is a rich church the church always becomes rich because of the members of the church remember that church itself is not rich the members of the church so he's telling them listen guys you, you you got money okay it's not that you lack 
you promised you will give, but you didn't. So I'm asking you, whatever you decided to give, set aside in your heart and give it. So as he goes on to say, now listen, he says, you need to do that because of, because you'll be embarrassed and I'll be embarrassed. Okay, we would be embarrassed too, not to mention your own embarrassment. If some Macedonian believers come to know, came to me and found out that you weren't ready, after all you promised you weren't ready to give, it could be any reason you didn't give. I, it, I understand you got your own businesses to run, your own families to run, your own things to do, but you already promised. So I thought I better send these uh, brothers ahead of me so, so as to make sure the gift that you promised is ready. Now, then he adds the extra sentence and he says, but I want you to do that not grudgingly. Just because I'm being sarcastic, don't give. That's what he's saying. Just because I scolded you right now, don't give. Don't give grudgingly. Don't even give obligatorily. But give cheerfully. Give it from here. You know, I've been thinking about the prayers that we pray, right? God, give me patience. Not to get angry. But how will I know that I will not get angry? Unless I encounter people who will make me angry. How will I know I'll be patient unless I'm encountered with people and situations that make me impatient? Are you listening? So he's saying, listen, I, I know how human hu human mind works, uh, so don't 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 give it out of obligation. Don't even give out of grudging grudge. You are giving, but you are not happy about giving. But give it cheerfully. Remember this: when you give it willingly, not grudgingly, you are planting seeds. You are planting seeds, which will become a crop. If you plant little, you'll get little. If you plant generously, you'll get generous. That's why each of you must decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to the pressure I'm putting you on right now. Don't do that. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Whether it is a command a reminder of the command of God, whether it is a sarcastic com comment to remind you of your commitment, either way, the scripture is trying to tell you, just become generous in life. Not, for, not, not, not because you will get something back, but because you will become a blessing to somebody else. And in, 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 in order of becoming a blessing to somebody else, you are blessed in the, in the process. Giving wholeheartedly, not half-cooked, not grudging, not obligatory. Giving with joy. And most importantly, giving without hypocrisy. More than Paul, Jesus was more sarcastic in this. I mean, Paul could be hard, but Jesus was, I mean, Jesus was like, like, how Virat Kohli thrashed last night, South African bowlers. Or Bumrah bowled. Some of you, if you don't get the cricket reference, don't worry. You are not an Indian. <laughs> it was hard. Je this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Be especially careful when you are trying to be good. So that you don't make a performance out of it. I'm reading from message version. Matthew chapter 6. It might be a good theater, but God who made you won't be applauding. God won't clap for you. That's what he's saying. You could put up a great performance of giving, doing good, but God is not going to have, God is not going to stand up and clap for you. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action. Uh, some of them, you've seen them. That's what he's saying. I'm sure 
They are called play actors. I call them play actors, Jesus says. Basically, he's calling them hypocrites. So they're hypocrites. Treating prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage. Acting compassionate as long as someone else is watching. Playing to the crowds. That means they want people to applaud them. They want everybody to see that they are praying, that they are giving, they are doing good things. Well, they will get their applause. True, but that's all they'll get. When you help someone out, don't even think about how it looks. Just do it quietly and obtrusively. It simply means this. Jesus is saying, when you give, don't expect anything back. That's what he's saying. This is how generosity looks like. Most of us, when we give, we expect something back. This is how we are wired. So I give 5,000. I give 1 lakh. I want God to bless me back with 10 lakhs. I want God, God to bless me back with 50,000. If not that, at least I want somebody else to stand up and say, Brother Chaitanya gave 1 lakh rupees to the church. Uh, at least, don't clap, huh, please. <laughs> I know who's trying to do that. Don't do that. But that's what we want. If not, we, we, we may not verbalize it. We, wa we would like for that to happen. What Jesus is saying is, don't want, you don't want that. If somebody claps for you, I'm not clapping for you. That's what Jesus is saying. If you're expecting somebody else to clap for you, don't expect me to clap for you. Do you want me to clap for you? Do it quietly. And don't even expect anything back. So expectations are two ways. One, I want the blessing or I want applause. One of those two. Jesus is saying no expectations. No expectations when you give to others. Well, there are so many people we do give as a church. Nobody has name of Capstone anywhere. Nobody has uh, your name or my name there etched up in some stones. And it doesn't really matter to us. What does it matter to us? Nobody may come back and say thank you to us. What does it matter? You and I are given enough in our pockets, in our banks, that we can take care of our lives, we can put food on our table, we can take care of our children's education, all of us. So what do we need? We don't need anything else. When we give up something for somebody else, we don't need them to come and say thank you to us. Don't expect that. In Capstone, don't, ex don't, 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 don't expect that when you give to missions for somebody else to come here and be under our network. It doesn't need to be. We, we need to learn to do that. No false motives. No expectations, meaning no hypocrisy. That's why I love Good Samaritan's um, par uh, story. Of course, the story is about how this man showed compassion. You know, of course... The entire story came out of Jesus' mouth because somebody asked the question, how should I love my neighbor? What does it mean to love my neighbor as I love myself? So Jesus to told the story of how you can show you love your neighbor. Right? Th that's why it's a good Samaritan story. And of course, that's what it is. But I think hidden behind, uh, underneath in the story of, of uh, how good Samaritan treated the Jew teaches us what generosity looks like. So this man rescues Jew who is his own enemy? Now, the, he may not have in his heart the Jew is his enemy, but the Jew thinks him as an enemy. Samaritans are looked down upon. They're outcasts. They don't belong to our caste, our community. They are niche people. That's the mindset, Jew mindset. So, if, I, if that Samaritan, uh, if the Jew was in a Conscious mode, he wouldn't have accepted help from Samaritan, by the way. Thank God he's lost conscious. So at least he could, he could get some help. So the Samaritan picks him up, goes out of his way, go to another village, the near closest village, puts him there in the inn, provides all the medicine, provides all the finances that are required for him to be treated well, then tells the manager, Hey, listen, I'm going on a business. When I come back, I'll come back again and I'll pay if there is any extra amount. 
He's not saying, keep the Jew until I come back. He's not saying that. He's saying, take care of him. When he gets better, send him. If you got extra expense, I'll cover it. In other words, he's saying, I have no expectations from Jew. The Jew may never turn back to him and say, thank you. May never show some kind of gratitude. He may never show that. Samaritan is well aware of that. I know this person will never say thank you to me. But it doesn't matter. I am showing generosity to him. And that's where God is pushing us all to go to. Capstonians, you need to go there. Don't be like every other person. Be different. Be like the one God wants you to be. Go to that extent. You don't expect anything back. There is no hypocrisy in your giving. That's cheerful giving. Number four, truth is this generosity leads to a wise life. Generosity leads to a wise life. Generosity gives us the wisdom. That's what I mean. It, it teaches us how to live well here on earth. Generosity. It teaches us what is more important in our life and what is less important in our lives. It teaches us, generosity teaches us that we must give up some things that we think are valuable for something that is more eternal. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, don't store up your treasures here on earth. Where moth and um, worms destroy it. But store up your treasure in heaven. Store it there. How, how do you do that? The only way to store your treasure in heaven is by helping others. That's the entire chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. Jesus is pushing people to that. Pushing people to that. Stop thinking self and start becoming a blessing. The moment you become a blessing, you will be blessed. You need to turn your focus onto that. You need to change your perspective when it comes to the matters of money, when it comes to the matters of things, when it comes to the matters of influence. You need to change. The moment you change your focus, you will see how blessing it is for you. That's investing in heaven. You know, We're all well aware of investment funds. All of us have Sahiyai. The thing about Sahiyai, right? You know, mutual fund Sahiyai. Now you got it. Well, some of you. <laughs> We're all well aware of mutual funds. We all are well aware of stocks. And there is nothing wrong with that. Bible actually teaches us to invest well. Okay? But we also need to be well aware of investment funds in heaven. How do you invest into heaven? When you give to somebody else, you are offering a worship to God. Did you know that? Psalm 3 verses 9. Honor the Lord by giving him the first part of your income and he will fill your bonds and overflows your barrels. Job 22 verses 24 and 25. Give up your lust for money then the Almighty Himself will become your treasure. You're honoring God. But when you give up, when you give it to somebody else, you're honoring God, you're worshiping God. You're saying, God, I worship you. That's why offering is a part of worship. Just as much as singing our songs, sitting here and listening to the word, giving your offering is also an act of worship to God. It's like, God, I worship you through my giving. That's how you invest into eternity. You invest into eternity by using your money to encourage the fellowship you are part of. When you give your money, you are encouraging the church. Not this church, the church of God. Of course, this church too, but the church of God. The fellowship that you are part of as you give, you are encouraging the fellowship. You are saying, listen, I got, I got you. Whom are you encouraging? You're actually encouraging yourself, right? Your own family. 
Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 10, love one another through mutual affection. In verses 13, he says, how do you do that? How do you show mutual affection? Share what you have with God's people. Share what you have with God's people who are in need. So when you begin to share th with those who are in need, you are showing mutual affection. You are becoming an encouragement to the church of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24, the author of Hebrews teaches us this. Think of ways. He's actually saying, think of ways on how to encourage one another with outbursts of love and good deeds in sharing. So you invest, when you give, when you give, you're investing into eternity. How? By encouraging the fellowship. And here is another thing. When you invest into eternity, you are growing in your character. You are growing in character. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 16. The earnings of the godly enhances their life. But evil people squander all their money. Actually, they are spending on themselves, right? How do you know the difference between a godly person and an evil person? He's spending on himself. So the he, he, Bible looks at him and says, they squander that money. But godly, they'll enhance their lives. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 23. Invest in truth and wisdom, discipline and good sense. Don't part with them. I like this verse. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 2. <clears throat> Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Well, actually, food is supposed to give us strength, right? But God says, does that do you any good? Listen, and I will tell you where to get food. And that is good for soul. And he goes on to talk about sharing. You invest. In the process of investing, you're growing. Your character is becoming better. You're becoming wiser. When you invest... It will help the kingdom of God to grow. That's the most important one. When you give, what you're doing in the process is that you're expanding the kingdom of God. Look at verses 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, I know Paul started off sarcastically, but he comes to a place where he's saying, listen, the reason I've been hard on you is because you can understand the kind of blessing you will be when you share. That's what he's trying to say. Okay, let's look at this. First of all, verses 11. Let me start off with verses 11. Yes, you will be enriched. You will be, personally, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you, when we take your gifts to those in need, those who need them, they will thank God. Basically, he's saying, listen, when you meet somebody else's need, they're praising God. Which, 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 which means you are praising God. Because of you, somebody else is praising God, meaning you are praising God. And then he goes on to say, so two good things will result in this. Generosity will result in two good things. From this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem, meaning the, the needs of those who are in need, in the church of God, okay, will be met. And they will joyfully express their thanks to God. When they say, thank God for providing my need through them. Who is being blessed here? The one who gave. The one who gave. Now the people in Jerusalem do not know you in Corinth. They are praising God. For God meeting their meat. But when they are doing it, they are also blessing you. So many people in uh, Jharkhand, many people in Palasa, many people who are meeting in the remote locations of Odisha or in Kenya or in Bhutan are praying God and thanking God for you. For you. You. 
because you gave, they come to know Jesus. Because you gave, those churches are growing. And the people who gather there every Sunday, they're praising God for what God did, did for God, what God did for them. But in the process, they're blessing Capstonians who chose to give to missions. Don't miss that. So Paul goes on to say, listen, verses 13. You honor God through your genuine act of service in your commitment to spread the good news of Christ through your generosity in sharing. The good news is spreading even though you are not going anywhere because of you. So, here is what my point is. The entire point is this. Do what you should do. What you should do, I already told you, you are, a com you are commanded to give and it is your responsibility to give. So do it. It's faithfulness. It's a mark of faithfulness doing that. Uh, th that's why I teach that in our church. That as much as you, for Capstonians this is, not for visitors by the way. This principle is for Capstonians. I mean, if you are a visitor, you want to learn this, please learn. That I teach in our church that you must give your tithes. That's your responsibility. That's your, that's your command. It's your call as the member of this church to support the church. But I ask you, Capstonians, that you develop a discipline of setting aside something for missions too. It's, it's a joy to do that. When you give your tithes, you are doing what God is asking you to do. But when you give out of what is left, you are giving sacrificially to the kingdom of God. You are giving to the mission of God. Don't get worked up in uh, describing what tithe is, what that is, what portion, whatever portion you want to give. Right now, I am not in a place to talk about that. So let me just teach you this. Give your tithes to your church and with the rest, out of what you have the rest, give to the mission field. That's sacrificial giving. And as you begin to do that, you're being faithful to God. Do what you should do. Do what you could do. If there are things that you can do, you should do it. If you, need, if you can use your influence, if you can go one more extra mile, even after you gave something. Because you see the need is more important than yours. Sacrificially as you take more steps. Um, you, you're a blessed person. Just simple. I, can't, I don't have more, more than this. I can't bless you. You're a blessed person. Just be that. Now here, is, here is the last thing. Do what you would do if you have money. Some of you could be sitting there and say, I have less, I have nothing. I'm saying, if in case you have money, what would you do? What would you do? Many of us use our future as our excuse for today. We're saying, tomorrow I will get. Mm. I'm asking you, do what you could do, what you should do, but what you would do too. How do you do that? How do you do that? By making a commitment in your heart that God, I would do this. Well, Paul was teaching that to the church in Corinth. That's all he was teaching. You already made a promise, right? You thought in your heart that I would do something. Why are you not doing it? And your excuses may be very genuine and it is true. But you already made a commitment in your heart. When you made a commitment, you should believe that God will give you. I didn't say that. Bible says that. Let's go there. I'll read that and I'll close. Okay. Verses 10. Well, well let me start with 8. God will generously provide all that you need. Remember that. God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need. And plenty left over to share with others. 
Now, how does that work? That is explained in verses 10. Okay? For God is the one who provides the seed. So, meaning, for those of us who want to do but don't have anything to do, he's saying, listen, in your heart, decide what you want to do. Say, God, I, I want to do this. I don't have a seed, but I want to do this. The moment you decide truthfully, God will place a seed in your hand. So it is God who provides the seed first. Now, when he provides the seed, you must plant it, right? You can't use it for yourself now. You can't say, I got more need. You can't do that. You already decided what to give. So God will give you that. When he gives you that, don't use it for yourself. That would be unethical. So use it, the plant, uh, the seed. Now when you do that, he says, then the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. In other words, he's saying, not only he'll give you the seed, when you plant it, he will increase it. He will increase it. He'll make it more. When you choose to give, he'll make it more. What is left with you, he'll make it more. He'll increase it. Now, here is the best part. And then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I'm looking at this verse and I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, the generosity of God is, is this. That if I want to be generous... God will give me the seed, number one. Then when I decide to put the seed on the ground, God will increase that seed. God himself is doing this. I'm not doing anything here. God increases that seed so that not only it will be sufficient for the need there, it is also sufficient for me. Then he says, it will also produce and multiply. Great fruit. It's unbelievable the generosity of God. Don't, 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 don't miss that in this. Don't look at the sarcasm of Paul. Look at what Paul is trying to teach to the church in Corinth. Look at what I'm trying to teach to you through the Holy Spirit today. Is this, that just be generous. You will see the kind of blessing it will bring to you. And the kind of success it will bring to your children and their children and the generations that come after. How Psalm 112 closes, and I'll close with this, okay? I'm sorry. I'm, today, I'm, I know I said the third time, I'll close. I'll really close now. Psalm 112, verses 10. Because I can't avoid teaching about this. Up to verses 1 to 9, he talked about righteous man being blessed. Only in verses 10, he talks the opposite. He does the antithesis. He concludes with an antithesis. What happens to those who are wicked people? In his mind, wicked people means those who don't follow God. That's all it is. Okay? Uh, and it's a very important thing. Following God, righteous. Not following God, wicked. Okay? Get that picture. Their desires will be thwarted. That's how he closed verses 12, uh, 10. Their desires, their wants will be thwarted, meaning they will fail in all that they want to do. That's what he said. Now I'm thinking in my head when I'm reading that verse, I'm thinking, so what kind of desires an evil person has? What kind of desires a wicked person has? In our definition, we already saw wicked person means those who don't follow God. Right? So what kind of desires this person will have? He will, he will th this, this is what I'm thinking. Even if that person is a wicked person, this is what he'll think, I want my children to be safe. I want my children to have a future. I want to make money so that I can save some money, buy some land, build a house so that my children can have a future. Isn't that what everybody thinks? Whether you follow God or don't follow God, isn't that where we all lead to? I want to be successful in my job. I want to be number one in my job. I want my business to grow. I want my family to be safe. I want joy in my life. Everybody is not going to be a Hitler, right? Who's thinking, I'm going to kill all the Jews. 
all of us normally want good family, good future. That's all we want. What else we want? So, just like a righteous man, even a wicked man is thinking, I want everything to be nice and smooth. Now, the antithesis is, if you, if the, because he doesn't follow God, he's not generous. And because he's not generous, he's not happy. Whatever he's praying for, wishing for, is not happening. That's what it means, his desires will be thwarted. He wants growth, he doesn't get growth. He wants a business to flourish, it doesn't flourish. He wants his children to be safe, they are never safe. He is always living in fear of their future. He is always living about, thinking about, oh my God, my son is going to become a drug addict. My daughter is going to, um, uh, uh, you know, leave, uh, become a rebel. This is how th he is going to think. What else is going to think? Well, if we don't understand this right now today, church. Uh, not only we suffer, we will make our children suffer. So as we go out from here, let's check our hearts. How, 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 how is our heart today when it comes to matters, all these matters? We must learn to become generous. Even if it's hard, discipline, must make it a discipline. Become generous. Because at some point you'll see the results coming back. The joy in your heart, the security, the comfort. You know, did you, did you see this? Go back and study Psalm 112, okay? By heart, Psalm 112. He says, they will live in confidence when they stand against their foes. Enemies will stand against them, but these guys will be firm. They'll have courage. They know their children are secure. Their future is secure. May all of you live like that. May all of you enjoy the blessing only God can give. I pray that. I, that's my wish. As long as God keeps me here, I'll keep teaching this. If you like it or not, don't like it. I'll keep teaching. Become a generous person. And you will see the kind of blessing God will bring into your life. Let's close our eyes. I'd like you to take a moment to pray, God, pray to God and offer yourselves to Him, your life to Him. And um, if, if you've been generous, I want to thank you for being a generous person. And you are indeed, many of you are. Praise God for all of you. I pray that you'd continue to be so. If you've lost your way, May, may the words of God become a source of encouragement to you to come and, uh, and help you to come and set in right path. If you have never learned to be generous, start being, developing a discipline of generosity from today. Don't postpone it to tomorrow. Don't postpone it to next year. Start being generous today. Let me take a moment to pray with you. And as, before I pray for you, I'd like for you to pray for yourself. You know, I'll give you a minute to pray for yourself. And ask God to help you to truly live a right legacy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Father, we thank you, God, for today. We thank you for your word. Your word, O oh God, is truly a light to our path. We receive your word, your correction, your rebuke. We receive your challenge and your encouragement. And we'd like to be like you, generous, compassionate, would you give us a compassionate heart? Would you give us a deep understanding of how good you have been to us? So out of that gratitude, we would learn to be more generous. 
towards others and offering forgiveness and going extra mile and doing more than what we are expected to do in offering our help in times of needs and sharing our resources with those who are in need. We pray that God, you would give us an opportunity to do that. Create an opportunity to become generous. We thank you for speaking to us today. As we go back, may our hearts be stirred up by the power of your word. Not only we become generous, we teach our children to be generous and the generations that come after. Thank you, God, for Capstone. Thank you, God, for every Capstonian. What a joy it is to work along with them, serve, serve you along with them. I and Janet, we want to thank you, God, for these wonderful people. We pray that you would bless them. Just as they have been a blessing to so many people, not just only through our church, but they themselves have been a blessing to so many other people, so many churches, so much of work of God. What a joy it is to see so many generous people gathered at one place. May we continue to keep that spirit, God. May we continue to live our lives for the sake of the gospel. Whatever way we can, whatever we should do, we will do. Whatever we could do, we will do. Whatever we want to, we will do, God. That's our commitment to you. Thank you for this privilege of serving you through generosity and worshiping you through generosity. Bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.